So uh, thank you everybody for showing up. We have a pretty big crowd here tonight, and uh, I'm guessing we're probably hitting on a pretty good subject. It seems there's been a lot of interest for this. Um, and thanks again for the, the wimp taters, the ones in the back and the ones up front, um, for setting this up. I always appreciate your hard work. We're going to talk a little bit about how we work. Uh, my focus is coming from a designer. Um, I do a little bit of front end also. Um, so it's kind of nice, I think. We've been talking a lot about development, but it's nice to get some uh, design perspective. So Melissa asked me to talk, and originally it was um, about Photoshop. She said she likes the, the work I've done in Photoshop, and you know, her and I have done some work together. And I started thinking about um, what would I talk about with Photoshop? Nate uh, last year gave a spectacular presentation on Photoshop, how to use it, and I learned quite a bit from him. And I didn't really know how to top that. Um, so I kind of went down the rabbit hole with this, and it's a little more of a holistic approach. Um, kind of approach, kind of how do we work with clients, and how do we design for the web? So um, a little bit more about me. Um, that's me in the middle with the glasses, if you can't recognize me. Um, so I've been designing and uh, using Photoshop for over 15 years. Um, you know, like, as I said, I do some front end. Um, I've worked as a Photoshop specialist, but my focus has always been on design. Um, I work for a small design studio, uh, Robert Mather and Gibbs. We work uh, mostly in the wine industry, but we, you know, we do work for all sectors. And we help our clients establish their brand in the marketplace, basically. Um, we're known for our design, especially, and um, I don't know, I think we do pretty decent work. So here's some of the, oh, it does work. Here's some of the work I've done. Uh, this is a responsive website um, did for Americano, a wine brand. Um, and this was actually one of my first uh, real big responsive web designs. Uh, similar situation, uh, another web design I did for Project Paso. Um, this is a great client of ours. These are different, different wine brands that they have. Uh, and this is actually the project I worked on with, uh, with Melissa and Wine in the Web. This was a new, uh, a new brand launch for one of our clients, um, Moniker. And I think it turned out uh, looking pretty good, thanks to Melissa's fine work. Um, there's various logos I've done. Um, if you guys know, have heard of Chimera in Sebastopol or Maker Hackerspace, they're, uh, they're kind of still up and, and going, but they have some pretty fascinating stuff going on there. So let's see. So, you know, again, this talk started, it started with Photoshop. And, you know, as you start going down the rabbit hole, um, there's a lot of uh, tools we can use out there, and it seems like every day there's more and more. There's SaaS startups, there's, you know, it's kind of overwhelming, and Macaw is kind of one of the new, big, uh, you know, fresh apps that are out there and doing some pretty cool, pretty cool work with it. Um, but I wanted to, to kind of think about the whole process a little bit. Um, so old school. Um, let me get caught up on my notes here real fast. Um, so, I mean, you know, typically in how we've done it and how, you know, I, we, I so often do it is, you know, you do your, your pixel perfect design, um, you know, it looks great, you hand that off to, uh, you know, the client signs off on it, and usually there's some back and forth on that. Um, sometimes more back and forth than we hope. Um, but we hand it off to the developer, and the developer does their thing. And it's kind of this whole separate, separate world. There's the designers over here, clients kind of hovering over here somewhere, and then you have the developers over off in their cave or something like that. Um, and I was kind of thinking, you know, this maybe not the best way to be building websites. I mean, how else could we do this differently? Um, there's obviously a lot of pieces that need to come together. You know, there's, there's not just, it's not just designs over here and developments over here. There's, you know, there's a lot of other things to, to think about, content, communication with the client, and how does all of that fit together? I think when um, we are working so separately in our own little areas, um, sometimes you know, some of the details are kind of fall through the cracks. So thinking about that, um, oh, and also I, I meant to say too, um, if you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Um, I'd like to try to get through this and not stop and belabor anything, but you know, if you want to slow me down or, or clarify something, feel free to raise your hand. And then at the end, I'd really like to have a conversation about this. I really want this to be something that we all talk about. I want to hear from you, because I'm not necessarily the, the most knowledgeable person in the room about all of this. I want to hear how you guys do it, too. Um, so 
typical model, how we've been doing it. Uh, we, so, you know, maybe we send a JPEG to a client, maybe we upload a design to Basecamp, and you know, we, we say, here you go, take a look at our design. Sometimes maybe there's some additional communication with that. Um, hopefully some of you better than I am sometimes and just saying, what do you think? Because um, what happens when you say, what do you think? What, what job have we given to the client? I mean, we haven't, we haven't really given them a specific job. They just say, what do you think of the, of the design? They have to, in their mind, they're gonna have to translate the flat pixels to a working website. And what happens? Well, they start picking it apart, right? Because that's, that's the job we've given them. And all of a sudden, you're talking over here, like, this has nothing to even do with the website. Why are we talking about your nephew? I don't know, it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. You know, the size of the photo, the, the photo selection even. I mean, yeah, that, that's definitely a design thing, but you know, you can always change that easier in the, in the code later on, right? And so that's kind of what happens. They, they, um, they're gonna pick it apart. Um, and I think I like this quote by, I'm gonna have a couple quotes by Andrew Clark because I really like um, the way he thinks about this. He's a, he's a talented uh, front-end developer and designer. Um, and he says, what often matters most isn't the way that we design, but the way we communicate it. And think about that. You do, you do a, a flat Photoshop design, send it off to a client, what are we communicating to the client? Um, are we communicating that this is going to be an interactive, uh, responsive design? It's kind of hard to do in, in that model. So I like to think about um, what do we need um, from the client? Uh, what do we need them to understand? Um, we need them to have a basic understanding of the web. You know, uh, responsive web design, obviously. They kind of you know, show it to them on, mul on multiple devices and, and how that works. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we need to have conversations of, you know, how does navigation work and search engines, and we need to make sure they're kind of up to speed with all of that good stuff. And, you know, luckily, most clients are, are I think, are more up to speed these days than they used to be. But also, we need to explain to them that everybody uses the web differently. Um, maybe the client uh, uses it mostly on the desktop, um, but I know a lot of us here, you know, will switch from mobile to tablet, and they really need to understand that I don't know, in my experience at least, oftentimes um, I think people in general think that most everybody else does things the way we do them. And you'd be, you'd be amazed how people use websites out there. I mean, there are still are people I know that will print them out before they even really try to read it on the screen and then flip through their paper and, I mean, but we need to accommodate those people, right? And the client needs to under, understand that the site's going to be used in multiple different ways. And then we need to think about, um, you know, one of the most important things, obviously, and this is kind of the one of the things I'm going to keep coming back to a lot, is what does the website need to do? Um, what problems are we solving? And that's where we're going to keep coming back to, especially when it comes to design. Why are we changing that button to a different color? Well, it comes back to the goals. What goals does the website have? What are we trying to do? And you know, oftentimes you might hear something like, well, we're trying to educate our customers on what our brand does. And it's not really a good enough answer. That's not really a goal. You need to drill down and get more specific with that. Um, and you need to keep asking questions until you can kind of distill down what is it that we really need the site to do. It needs to be more specific than that. And obviously we need content. I, I don't know how, I can't tell you how, how many times I've been designing a site with no content. And <laughs> it's so frustrating. Because you know it's going to change later. You're doing it in, in Photoshop. and who knows when the content shows up. Oftentimes, oh, the site's almost built. I guess we better get that content to you. So <laughs> as much as you can get the content up front, I mean, if you really, you know, if you really want to design a successful site, you really need that content up front, um, including photos and, you know, the scanned logo that they pasted into Word and then faxed two times and said, is that Vector? Does that work for you? I know. I'm sure we've, obviously, we've all dealt with that. Um, and once we have those things, then we can really start working with the client, and then we can really start doing our work as designers. Oops. So, <clears throat> um, communication with the client, communication with the developer, communication with all the stakeholders on the team early and often. I think that's really important. And getting the client to buy in on your process 
early. Understanding what you need from them early is really helpful. Um, and framing the community, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> just a little water. Uh, framing the conversation. This is something I'm going to refer to again in, in, as we get more into this, is when you're talking about design, especially on the web, there's two things you can talk about, uh, layout and atmosphere. And I'm going to come back to that. But uh, layout is kind of just where does the stuff live on the page? You know, the, the sidebars on the right or the left, that's layout. Uh, the color of the sidebar, that's atmosphere. The type, that's atmosphere. The, the textures, that's atmosphere. And it's important that, you know, you kind of start thinking about that early on because you can actually kind of piece those things out a little bit as you get into the design process. Let's see. And then curiosity, um, asking questions. Um, I think, you know, I always say it's, it's more important to find the right questions to ask than it is to have all the answers. I mean, that's what WIMP's for, right? You jump onto the Facebook uh, forum, and every single time I've asked a question, I've always gotten a good answer, uh, or several good answers. Um, so continue asking the questions and drilling down, and, you know, it helps your client along to figure out what it is they need, because a lot of times they don't always know where they think they know. And the more questions you ask, and, you know, sometimes we make the assumptions of what we think they want. But as we keep asking and really drilling down and figuring out what is the goal of this site, it really helps us to educate the design. So another quote by Andrew Clark, worse than any deficiency is the frequent absence of communication when we hand a visual to someone and ask them to judge it. And instead of using visuals as aids to communication, we let the visuals speak for us. This happens especially when we email them or, up, email them or upload them to Basecamp along with some vague requests for thoughts. So, and that's what we do a lot, right? I mean, I know I've heard from a lot of, and I, I do it all the time. I try, I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. And I am trying, I mean, part of this talk for me is how can I change my workflow? But I've definitely been guilty of this. But, I mean, that's what happens, right? You send a, a JPEG and say, well, what do you think? And they're gonna tell you what they think. But it's not gonna be what you wanna hear. So, as Melissa asked me to come and talk about Photoshop, I'm here to talk about how can we stop using Photoshop? <laughs> the good listener that I am. <laughs> no, I don't always play by the rules. Um, so, for me at least, I, I, I can't get away from photo, Photoshop totally. Um, I love Photoshop. I know, right Nate? It's Photoshop's nice. awesome. I, yeah. I mean, when I first started designing, I would literally dream in Photoshop, and I would try to, like, I'd be in real life, I'd be trying to hit multiple levels of undo, because I'm in Photoshop <laughs> so often. So I love Photoshop. But I don't know that it's necessarily, the way at least I've been using it in the past, I don't know that it's necessarily the best way to be um, designing for the, the modern web. So I came up with a workflow, and some of it may be overkill, and some of it may have been missed some parts. But for me, it's about getting the conversation kind of rolling with all of us. Um, and some of the things that I wanted to, to hit would be it to be efficient, uh, communicate with the client well, be flexible, uh, emphasize good design, obviously, because my background is heavily in design, and use Photoshop as little as possible. So like I said, we, I'll be going through some of these steps. And we may not use all of these steps, but it's a springboard. So we have, um, starting the process, a user experience document, um, a content wireframe, sketch, 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 big fan of sketching, you might be able to tell, uh, a, a layout wireframe, we'll get to all of this in more detail, style tiles or uh, style prototypes, and um, you know, at some point we're probably going to have to build something in Photoshop. Definitely the style, I build the style tiles in Photoshop, but you know, we may have to build out a couple of pages or, or more or less, depending on if we're doing the front end, like if I'm doing the front end design myself, um, I could conceivably skip the whole, um, lay out a full page, but if I'm handing it off to a developer, they're probably gonna wanna see, you know, something mocked up. And then build, you know, that's the easy part, right? Just kidding. <laughs> um, so I kind of have two, 
two uh, examples of a good UX document. Um, and I really like the page description diagram. And then there's also a priority guide. I like the priority guide because that emphasizes um, responsive web design and the mobile views. So the page description diagram, I think this is a great, I don't know, has anybody used something like this before? Is this familiar to anybody? Of course, Ben, yeah, shocking. Um, so I love this because again, it goes back and it ties to the goals of the site. I mean, that's literally what this, what this document does. You have over here, unfortunately you probably can't read it, but you have over here on the left, the high priority goals of, and this is for a specific page. So, you know, again, uh, a lot of my experience is from medium to small websites. As you start getting into larger websites, um, you know, you might pick particular um, pages for this. You're not going to necessarily do every single page. But um, the idea is over here on this side, these are the really high priority items. Uh, medium priority and low priority. And just think about what's high priority on a page, right? Uh, initially, you might think the logo and navigation, but that's actually in the medium area because that's something that's on every page. That's something that obviously has to be on a site. You can't, you can't get rid of it. Um, but the stuff on the left, these are maybe, you know, the call to actions, the, the click through buttons. Um, you know, maybe there's a particular message you really want people to see. And this is a really important document because we keep coming back to this throughout the whole process. When you start, when you start getting stuck in that mire of, uh, you know, going back and forth on what sometimes might feel like insignificant details from, in our perspective, the client's really stuck on. We come back to here and say, well, uh, what design decision is going to, um, you know, best suit our needs looking at this document? What's, we're looking at a high priority item and you're making it really small because you think it's ugly. We can maybe design it differently, but it needs to be big. People need to see it. It needs to be above the fold. Can you give the titles for that first one? Um, the titles as, as far as, I don't know that I can actually. Um, yeah, to be, to be honest, this, to be able to read, I, I can, I can, I'll send out examples of this. I'm gonna, I'll do a little write up and I'll give you guys links to everything. Um, the actual titles of these really aren't that important except for the fact that high priority, medium priority and low priority. Um, and I, I haven't really used this specific document, but I came across it and I love it. So it's not, if you really want to ask questions, maybe Ben, at the end of the talk, he can, he can fill us in on how he's used it. Um, but the, the goal of this, and it doesn't have to be, this doesn't have to be your document, but you need something to start the project with that tie into what are the goals of the website. So it doesn't really matter if this is, if this is it. I, I happen to like this one, but I think it needs to be, I think you need to have something in writing. I mean, we always start the process in writing to, to catch the scope of the site. Um, but I like, and this might come after kind of the initial talk with a client. Um, this might be meeting number two, depending on how you do things. Text is a lot easier to revise. <laughs> yeah, it's fast. And, th and that, exactly, that's efficiency. I mean, this, this is a really efficient way to do it. And just like Ben said, it's really fast and easy to revise. Exactly. Thank you. Um, here, this is interesting. Personally, I kind of like the, the, the first document for myself better, but this is interesting as a priority guide. It's basically, um, it's basically just a, a wireframe, and all the important stuff goes at the top. You have you know, these little, these little uh, call-outs saying what, um, what's supposed to happen on this page. And the reason I included this is it, it might be worth doing a couple of these, especially if you're having a hard time explaining responsive web design to a client. Because, I mean, that's your mobile view right there. But like Ben said, I, I like having, um, at least starting with writing, because it's easy to revise, you can keep coming back to it, and there is nothing visual tied to it. You have to have the goals with the writing. Um, now, this is another, uh, this is a great way when we talked about content earlier. This is, I've used this for a couple clients and has worked really well. Um, this actually can kind of help, um, can also be a little bit of a wireframing um, for layout a little bit, but uh, I refer to this as a content skeleton. I've done this where I just get the content from the client and I just dump it into, I think I was using a foundation on this, but you can use Bootstrap or, you know, however you like to start your sites. I know most of you developers, Aaron, I'm sure you have a starter template, um, bare bones, you know, skeleton, dump everything in there. You have all of the content in there. You're accounting for the navigation, at least what goes in the navigation and the client can click through it. They can see all of their content and this doesn't take very long. 
And the great thing, thing about it is they see early, early on in the project, we haven't even started designing yet, and they see early on where all the holes are in the content. Because, I mean, we're designing web pages. We should have all the content, right? Um, and I, f I find this just a great way to communicate with a client, great way to keep the uh, project moving along and receiving all the deliverables that you need. And sketch, sketch all the time, sketch a lot. Uh, I'm actually, I'm a fine artist and I can draw really well, but as you can see from my sketches, I'm not very good at sketching. My sketches are messy and um, they're not that great, but I force myself to sketch a lot because there's no better way than to get the ideas out of your head as quickly as possible. And there's two things that you want to do in sketching. One is, you know, you want to figure out what are your good ideas, because sometimes we think we know what our good ideas are. But, you know, after a series of rounds of sketching, you realize, actually, that first idea wasn't that great. I have a, really, a much better one. But for me, I like to get the bad ideas out of my head. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times when I'm designing, I have... You know, sometimes I get stuck on something that it just, it just keeps coming back, it keeps coming back. And this is a great way for me to get it out on paper, look at it, and, you know, I like to set the sketches aside for a little bit, come back to them, and then I come back and go, oh, God, no, that was terrible. But I didn't do that. Um, so this can be a really handy way to also work quickly. I mean, everything that we've been looking at here, uh, you can do really fast. I mean, we, we're in, you know, what, three, three steps or so? Yeah, we're at three steps, and all of this goes really quickly. This helps to communicate with the, the client, um, you know, everything that you want and need from them. And then, you know, depending on how you feel, I mean, some people show sketches to the client. Sometimes you can even use them as a wire framing. Um, personally, I don't usually show the sketches to the client, largely because I'm maybe not the best uh, sketch artist. Um, but this is for me. Sketches are for me. And I like to, um, you know, sometimes get away from the computer if I can. I'll do some research, figure out what sites do I like. And then maybe put some headphones on and, you know, even at my desk if I just move, move to the side um, and just kind of get the, the ideas flowing. And it's, um, it's really valuable. And then uh, there's wireframing. Um, I have some mixed thoughts on this. Um, I don't always wireframe. I do it sometimes. Um, I've talked to some people that wireframe and they swear by it. And I've talked to some people that wireframe, but it's only internally. They never show it to the client. But... In this particular context of what we're talking about, wireframing would refer to the layout. What we talked about for design, there's atmosphere and then there's the layout. Um, and this kind of tells you, you know, where does everything live on the page? Um, you, again, you refer back to the initial document in the beginning, the, um, the UX document, and figure out, you know, what are the goals? Um, you kind of start to figure out where everything lives on the page. There's a lot of really great programs out there um, to do this. Um, you know, you can even, I often use uh, Photoshop for uh, wireframing too, just because I'm fast with Photoshop. Hey, hey. Yeah? In terms of wireframing in your experience, you know, I know you've worked with small, medium, and large projects. Um, do you find in your instances where wireframing is a way to justify our existence, especially on bigger projects? $50,000 website for a 10 pager, but it's extremely complex. The wireframing system becomes a way to drill down in front of the CMO or in front of a market director. You know, are you are you seeing that in the way that you're designing, or is it that you're not wanting to use wireframes because you've just done it so many times? It's it's a it's not a system that's necessarily practical. You know, and I'll be honest. Um, I'm hesitant even including wireframes in there. I don't really use them that often. Um, the, when the times that I do use wireframing, a lot of times it really is just for me. Um, and I like to start kind of wireframing maybe the template pages, the, you know, the home page, the, the important pages internally. Um, and I don't, I don't usually show them to the client. Um, I find it's for me, it's mostly just trying to figure out, trying to account for everything on the page. On the other hand, I know other, there are some people that swear by them, and it's a really important part in their process. And um, hopefully someone here can um, talk a little more about them and how they use them, because personally, I don't really don't use them that often. Although I...
increasing the fidelity of the, the, the final delivery function. So you start with text. It's very, very ambiguous. It's not sharp at all. Then you go to the sketch, which defines it a little bit more. Then you mm -hmm. find the sketch with wireframe. Then you might even go to a comp, where it's pixel perfect. So every step along the way, you're increasing fidelity. Mm -hmm. so it may not be appropriate to do a wireframe if you're going from the sketch to a fairly simple HTML page. But for much more complex interactions, that's true. And again, you know, like I said, a lot of my experience comes from the smaller sites. I think um, there are definitely instances where, you know, if you feel like you really need to communicate something um, a little more effectively, you may not necessarily have to wireframe, you know, a 50 page site and have 50 wireframes. But um, there's also, you know, one thing that I'm, that I, in doing this talk, I realized I haven't accounted for is um, sometimes some of the mobile, um, some of the mobile views. Um, you know, especially if it's a mobile-heavy app or something like that. And again, th this is, for me, it's mo more focused on websites than apps. But, um, you know, that's about my take on it. I don't know. <laughs> what's, your, what's your percentage in terms of what you show client wireframe? I don't know that I've really ever shown a client on wireframe, personally. Okay. Yeah. Often it's the wireframe, but they don't see the sketches. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And again, uh, um, when I do, when I do, show, when I have shown clients wireframes, it's been more um, this this setup, and this has become more of a wireframe. It's actually in live HTML, um, and I like it because it's you know it's responsive. It's an actual website. Um, yeah, I know so. I'm intrigued that you push so heavy for content up front. You know, I, you know, I can't tell you. As, as a designer, when I don't have the content, just the entire time I'm working, and the like, the hairs in the back of my neck are standing up. Like, I can't tell you how frustrating it is for me, and I can't tell you how frustrating it is when, um, you know, oh, I'll just design it. and We'll add the content later. It doesn't. I mean, you you can do it, but you're not going to get a better product. And and my work is compromised. Your website is compromised. It's just unfortunately that's fairly common, and it's it it just kills me. Sometimes. Not the specific content, but we know we're going to have a headline and a lead and an attribution and a body of content. And if you can get those things nailed down, take the time to write content because we know that's a good point. components of the yeah, that's a good point. And typically, when, when we do find ourselves in a situation where we don't have the content, I mean, usually we do have a decent idea of what the content is going to be. And oftentimes, I'll find myself either you know writing some dummy content myself or picking some content from some other projects and putting it in there and making sure the client says, you know, kind of you get some rough sign off on, yeah, that's the type of content we're going to have in there. But for me, I just, if, if I have to design to lorem ipsum and I don't have any kind of guidance on what's going to go on that page or what the content's going to be, I, I just, it, it's really difficult for me. Uh, but that's a good point, Ben. Thank you. I, I agree with you because I found myself in a situation where the content is actually so disruptive that it skewed the aesthetics of the site. And I, it was like um, pulling, pulling teeth to get some content from Yeah. So it, it skewed it. So you mean like you got like way more content than you expected or way less content or? No, the nature of the content. The nature of it? The text. And, you know, you have too artistic, but it was actually what turned to be um, uh, from uh, like a subtle chain kind of branding concept to one that's really quite disruptive. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, I've been there before where, you know, you're kind of pretty far along in a visual and all of a sudden, you know, that's one of the, I think that's one of the problems when um, you do rec start receiving some of the, you know, whether it's photography or, you know, the, the text later in the project and maybe you had the initial meeting with the client up front and we thought we're going in this direction and all of a sudden they don't tell you and they've gone in this direction. Yeah, that's, that's not something you want to have to do. I think we had a question here first. So it seems to me, um, especially when you're looking for content up front, it kind of becomes a creative brief of what you're doing. So is, is the, the guy who's trying to design the look and feel of something, you know, if they haven't really told you what the brand is about, you look into the content to kind of create that. 
they don't do that. What you ask for in, in place of that? Because how do you say, well, I see this looking corporate, or I see this looking more hippie, or I see mm -hmm. this looking more artistic, or whatever? Well, I mean, ideally, when we have the first meeting with the client, we're ideally we're going to get a pretty good idea of, you know. I mean, usually if, they have, if there's an established brand, you can look at, you know, what, well, yeah, I mean, even like, you know, so we deal with wine labels a lot. I mean, I can take a look at a wine label and already I kind of know what their target demographic is. I've been doing it for long enough. Um, you know, the price point and who they're aiming for. So, you know, actually, to be honest, we actually receive a lot of creative briefs and, you know, nine times out of ten, they're really not that, that helpful. I mean, just, just looking at the, the actual artwork that they've created and talking to them uh, is way more useful for us. It, and it really just comes down to talking to the client. Um, you know, that initial, you know, anytime you have a sit down with them, um, it's, it goes back to the curiosity. You know, keep asking questions. If, if, if I don't feel comfortable, the way I look at it is as soon as I walk away from this meeting and I envision myself sitting down in front of the computer, do I have a decent idea of what I'm going to start doing? Because if I don't, then, you know, I, what, what do I do? Then I need to keep asking more and more questions. Um, so for me, you know, oftentimes it just comes down to that first meeting. I mean, usually, usually I walk away from that and um, I have a pretty decent idea of, you know, maybe not necessarily exactly what the website is going to look like, but I have a feel for it. And, and for me, um, <laughs> I think, you know, uh, coming from a design uh, background and, and an art background, um, as, as a designer, a lot of times I really, I, I do go by feel. Um, I think it's probably something that drives developers crazy, you know, and that's why a lot of what we're talking about is going through these steps that you can articulate to a developer kind of what you want because telling, you know, whether it's a client or me telling a developer, it doesn't feel right. Okay, well, we're not going to get anywhere from that. What doesn't feel right? Why doesn't it feel right? What's, what's wrong about it? Um, and those are the types of questions that I think you, that I have to ask at least. Does that, that, make, does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah. I think we had... Oh, the, you can you can use whatever you're comfortable with. This was um, it's called Foundation. It's um, just a, a CSS framework made by Zurb. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've heard of Bootstrap. That's another really popular one, um, and that's just something that I use because it's fast. Um, it's got all of the kind of browser compatibility already built in, and I don't have to worry about all of that stuff. And it, it in the, in this particular case, it was pretty easy to just you know. Um, you know, no frills, no design, and, and that's kind of the entire, that's the important part about it, that it isn't designed. And you have to communicate, make sure the client understands that, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, this is, this is not designed. This is just for your content and just trying to get a feel for what lives on each page. And, and that's actually really useful, um, you know, to, to make sure that you're on the same page with the client about where everything goes. It's sometimes called the HTML prototype. There you go. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And what I've done in the past when I don't have the content is I'll put, you know, um, you know, a lot of times we'll do the photography too for our clients and say, you know, uh, beauty photography shot here, um, you know, winemaker bio here, um, so that we I am labeling what is actually going to go there, and um, and putting in some placeholder copy for that. So at least we can start thinking about what is actually going to live there. Yeah, a good copywriter is really worth their weight in gold. I can tell you that. Right, Barbara? Yes. And all the other copywriters here. I just met Barbara tonight. Samara. <laughs> um, 
We get a little bit of everything. You know, uh, there, the, one, the one thing about, kind of about this process too that I wanted to talk about, and that's a good way to bring it up, is that, uh, you know, there's never one process that's always the same. Um, you know, sometimes the clients come to us and they just say, hey, you're the expert, help us figure out what we want. And sometimes they have a pretty good idea of what they want and then we just need to, um, to kind of make that happen for them. I would say more often than not, that's not the type of clients that we have, um, you know, we've already had a relationship with them. We've already been doing a lot of work for them, and um, they t tend to put a lot of trust into how we're going to do it. So um, it, it comes in all shapes and forms, and I, there's definitely not um, one way. I mean, you know, we may try to kind of fit it with into our um, our framework of how we do things, but um, every client's different. Uh, just my my two cents. Um, I I mostly build sites for, you know, lower budget, um, smaller sites, that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I effectively charge more for clients that don't have their content prepared <laughs> by giving them the incentive that you can pay, you, you can, you know, keep your budget down by having everything ready before we even start the design process. And, yeah. uh, it works really well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually a good point that I wanted to bring up. I mean, this is a great way of letting the client know, uh, you know, we don't have all the content for, you know, the bios or, or whatever particular page, and start tying it into the goals again. The goal, our goal is to launch on the 25th of whatever. Uh, you know, you're actually holding the process up. Not only that, you're actually potentially going to make the process take longer and tie that into money. You know, find a way... Sometimes it's awkward to have conversations about we gotta start charging you more money, but um, you know there are different ways to say that. You know, say I'm, I'm afraid this you know our our budget is going to have to increase because blah blah blah. Or, you know, there are nicer ways to say that basically you're causing this project to cost more and take longer. So sketching, um, wireframing, and style tiles. Um, I was really hoping that the other Erin was going to be here tonight, but she had to cancel because she actually uses style tiles a lot. And I've used them a little bit. And this is what, this would be the atmosphere of the design. And for me, I'm still kind of getting used to the feel of this. and I'm still not 100% sold on them because I'm used to designing kind of functionality and the look of it kind of all together. And w with this, I mean, you know, you can have some functionality uh, built into it. These particular style tiles... Uh, this one, you know, I'm a 49ers fan, so Bay Area. Um, you know, here's one for, I think it was the Eagles, Philadelphia area. Uh, they're done by Vo uh, Vox Media, and this is SB Nation. And they have some really good blog posts out there about how they went through their process of doing the style tiles. And the basic idea is, you know, for each style tile, you're going to have um, different fonts, different colors, textures, uh, maybe the way you treat photos, the, treat, the way you treat author bios, um, and bylines and all that. And you can kind of just start playing, you know, especially with the typography. I mean, the typography is so important in design. I think it's becoming um, more respected for web design, obviously now that we can use web fonts and everything, but it's becoming more respected in web design than it ever has been, um, especially considering how much reading we do. Um, so the idea is, you know, one of the reasons, again, Brian, that I talked about uh, wireframing is that's kind of the general layout. And if you think about it, if you have the general layout of a page and then you have the, the atmosphere of the page with the style tiles, you kind of have the full design even though you don't have it in one particular uh, deliverable. Does that make sense? You know, it's interesting when you uh, the interior design, you're going to rebuild a big space. Wood boards. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, the stitching and the color palettes and... Yeah, totally. I, Summer, I'm sure you're familiar with mood boards. I'm sure you've done them before. You worked with them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's it's uh, kind of a, a little more design than a than a mood board. I mean, you're you're really starting to pick fonts and and playing with type and and you know starting to think maybe maybe some little um, UI um, elements on the page and and so on. And um, again, you know, as Ben was talking about, as you're kind of um, pushing from you know the low fi to the high fi. Um, you're starting to kind of, start, the design is starting to crystallize a little bit more. Um, 
This is really actually kind of starting to look like something now. And I have done these um, a couple times. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever showed them with a client, shared them with a client yet. But for me, it was a nice way. Actually, when I was working with Annette, I keep hitting this microphone. When I was working with Annette on the, uh, the website in a day, I actually, I actually did the, um, the wireframe process. It was um, just um, you know, gray boxes, gray type on a page. And I did the style tiles. And actually, I did show it to the client. And that really sped us up. Because I get the whole layout with the, just think about, you know, um, I should have had an example of it. But um, if anybody saw Nate's um, Photoshop presentation, I think that's how you started, Nate. Yeah, so we started just, you know, drawing the, the layout of the page um, just with gray boxes, gray type. And then, so once you have that and you, and you feel like you're, you're, you know, you like the layout, and you, you like the style tiles, or, you, or the client has approved the style tiles, then you basically have your, your web page. And here's, an, here's another example. Um, and you can see, I mean, there, there's some nice refinement in the design here. And there's a lot of thought and work that's gone into it. But you're not having to worry about the UI yet, and you're not having to worry about a lot of the other elements, but you can get it pretty far along. If you were going to put that in front of a client, how many of the details would you actually get specific with them on changing them? Um, so let's, let's call that yeah. 25 elements there. Would you highlight every single one? And, you know, I, I, I like the fuzzy, but I don't like the fuzzy. And you know, um, maybe we can pull some t uh, style tile examples out there. I think it's different for every client. And I think it's, it depends on, and it's different for every, every project. Um, it depends on how much, I mean, how much do you need to show to uh, give enough of an idea of what the site is? I mean, this particular site, um, you know, they're having, I mean, you know, tons of people hitting it every single day. Um, and they're going to put a lot more effort into it, probably. And it's pro it was, you know, as far as budgets, I mean, there's a huge budget on it. Um, I don't think most of us are working on um, the budget that these guys probably had to work on it. That being said, um, enough to um, get your point across. Um, there's a, if you do a search for style tiles, there's a, a website out there that explains how to use style tiles. I can't remember the, the female's name, but she does a great job of, of kind of walking through the process. And hers are, aren't, aren't as in-depth in the, as this. There's actually, um, and there's, a, there's actually a, um, a Photoshop template out there of style tiles you can use to, to base your designs off of. And, it, and it's, not, it's not as involved in this. I mean, these are, these are pretty well designed and pretty far along. Does that sort of answer your question? OK. Um, Another way you can take it, especially if you um, have some good front-end chops, is a style prototype. Um, this would be something that would be responsive. Um, you could even start maybe including some, um, some buttons or um, you know, some other elements on the page. And it's kind of, you know, same flavor as a style tile, just something that's built uh, in a browser. And it, you know, the nice thing about it, too, is, you know, as you start building in the browser, well, obviously, whatever you um, have sign off on this, you can start using for your actual code. If you have bigger apps, this often is helpful as a pattern library. Mm -hmm. When you're doing so on a big project, I can build this all out. And if they need to add a new component, I've already defined how all the interactions work, how all the components fit together. And they can just take the HTML and drop it in, and the style sheet's already there. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, once you have this, you're really close to having a style, style sheet to, um, or style guide to, to build, you know, everything off of. And, you know, it's nice when you're done with a, a site to, to have a style guide um, because any future design you have, somebody else can pick that up. And this is kind of, you know, a couple more steps and you're almost there. Um, and then you just build the site up. So then you're done, right? Um, so, you mean, where, where are you at this point? It depends on your process. Um, like I said earlier, if, if, if this is my process and I'm not handing it off to another developer and I'm doing all the front end, well, I would feel really comfortable at this point um, to just move everything into the browser. Um, I mean, we would be so close if we get sign-offs on, um, you know, a, uh, the wireframe layout and the style tiles. Um, we have the, the layout and we have the atmosphere. Um, Let's just start building it out. If you know, if there's anything we need to adjust at that point, we can certainly adjust it in the in the HTML. And I would say, for the most part, everything's going to be a lot faster to do that that way. But also, I think by the time you get through all of this, 
you have the, um, the UX document that points to all the goals of the site. You have um, the design basically signed off for the layout and the atmosphere. And after that, you're really just making sure that your goals are being met and for the, you know, for the site. And you can, you can keep pointing the client back uh, to those goals if they try to make any you know, kind of weird kooky changes at this point. But I think you get to this point and really they're more into using the site, reading the content and, and everything. Does that, does that make sense more or less? Anybody have any questions about that? Talk about it. I'm sorry. Sure. No. No. That's. Thank you for clarifying. That's a really good question. I didn't. I didn't explain that thoroughly. Um, this would be done in Photoshop. The style tile would be. A, it would be something you would do in Photoshop. Um, so you, there would be no CSS yet. If you were to do the um, a style prototype, this would be with HTML. Um, so this would not necessarily follow this. This right here, you're not particularly following any particular layout. Um, I mean, you could definitely bring in some of their live content, which would you know wouldn't be a bad thing. But you're not necessarily following a particular layout. This is this is just for the the look and feel of it. Um, any interactions that you feel like might be really important, especially in mobile views, um, this where is where you could build them out. Mm -hmm. A lot of database building content. And there's, you know, maybe half a dozen pages to the site from the design point of view, even though there might sure. be a thousand pages, right? Mm -hmm. It's all built out. And the way we typically work is the designer will deliver Photoshop mock ups of uh, three, four, five, six pages. And when we're working with clients, you know, we, we generally ask them to sort of show us some things they like, show us mm -hmm. some things they don't like, mm -hmm. and then we'll deliver them to the Home, front homepage concepts, right? Mm -hmm. And then get them to give us feedback on that. And then we'll turn those around with the second round. And at that point, we find we're usually pretty close. And we find that when, when we prototype stuff in HTML, it tends to lead to less sophisticated designs than if it gets built in Photoshop first, right? Because when you're building something in HTML, it's just really hard not to be lured into what's easy in HTML, what yeah. CSS naturally does. And so, you know, we really try to have non-coders doing the visual design, people that are sort of that other sort of way of seeing the world, mm -hmm. just to make something that, you know, looks really great, and then turn that over to a coder, and then turn sure. it into something. Sure. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And then the thing we've found is that particularly with these structured content sites where you might have, say, 10,000 articles or 500 products or whatever, I mean, usually our customers have all that content because we usually we're migrating mm -hmm. from something else. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge we've seen is that the designers will design something and, you know, it'll, they'll do this neat product page, you know, where the, the, the picture is here and the description is here and this mm -hmm. fits under here. And then you put the real content in and none of it actually fits. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, we try to tell people right at the beginning to expect that this is an iterative process. That the That's goal good. Of the Photoshop design mm -hmm. is to get the visual feeling of the thing. Um, then we build it, then we get all the real content in, and then we iterate through two or three cycles. I, and I, I, yeah, I think the important part about that is iteration. I think you really have to explain to the client that I think the biggest takeaway from this is if, you know, if you're doing your design as a, as a, and sending it as a JPEG and you send it to the client, you know, that's not a website, but it looks like a website. You know, you present it to them on a website, but it's not, and it's, gonna, it's going to change. And, and you know, I've, I've spent many years doing exactly that process. I, I haven't, haven't typically done, I've worked in the past on some larger sites. Like I said, now we don't usually do anything that large. And I've done that, and it works. It does. I mean, I've done it for years. Um, for me, and it depends on everybody's process, too. For me, it's a frustrating process, especially when you take into account responsive web design. 
Um, for me, it kills me if I have to do uh, a mobile view, a tablet view, and a desktop view. I, for me, I feel like is just such an amazing waste of my time. Um, because, you know, if you're looking at responsive views, that can be done, that can be done so much better in the browser. And to be honest, uh, I, initially in my talk, I had, um, you're talking about going from sketching right to the browser. And I know there are some people that, that can successfully do that. Um, I think Ben, again, sometimes you may have talked about that a little bit. Um, I'm not that comfortable in my front end skills that I'm not fast enough. I'm faster in Photoshop and I can whip out Photoshop mockups really quickly. Um, but yeah, that, that wouldn't work for me. Yeah. But, but I think the style tires, style tires are kind of a nice happy medium um, because even if it's just for me, I mean, I could whip out a handful of style tiles fairly quickly and then, you know, may, maybe, you know, and talk about iterating, um, for me, the next time I do a web project, I probably will do some style tiles. Uh, whether or not I share those with a client, I don't know yet. Maybe the next project after that, I'll do some style tiles and maybe I'll share those with a client. And I'll start adding a few of these parts of the process along the way that I think they might, they might speed me up. Because, um, you know, if, you, if you're looking at doing a, you know, e-commerce and, you know, you get the final text and nothing, nothing quite fits, that's kind of one of the problems for me in designing in Photoshop. It isn't the web. And if I do a good enough job of um, realizing what all the content is, realizing the limitations of the web, realizing that um, I need to account for, you know, longer titles of things so that I have to make sure things will flow properly, that works great. But for me, there's always something I leave out. There's always, oh, shoot, I didn't realize, I didn't take that particular interaction in account or, or something. So, I mean, you know, if you explain to the client that, you know, this is going to change and expect it to change, that I think you have to. I don't think there's any other way to do it. So, and I'm not saying that your process is wrong. I'm saying here's some other different ways to do it. And a lot of this is new to me, too. And I'd like to add to that too, as a designer, making sure that my deliverables, that all the margins are the same pixels, that I'm not going to drive, because, you know, doing front end myself, I know how maddening that is. You're like, well, I don't know, it's 10 pixels over here and it's five pixels over here. Which one am I supposed to do? I mean, I'd probably average it out if, it was, if I was doing it, but, because um, <laughs> what the heck. Uh, seven and a half pixels. Yeah, <laughs> seven and a half, exactly. <laughs> Developers. Um, <laughs> Uh, but my point is that if I'm working on, let's say, six different pages of PSDs, and then maybe I'm doing some responsive views also, that's 12 PSDs right there. What happens if, you know, oh, God, you know, my designer OCD is really bugging me. There's this particular padding around, you know, something, and, I, and it's, it's, you know, I want to change it from five pixels to seven pixels. It, just, it looks better. I like it better. 
Well, now I have to change that 12 times. And that takes a long time. You know, those are the things. For me to get the first design done, the first home page, even the second design done, that actually isn't, you know, it takes time. But it takes time to design it in any program wherever you're designing it. The stuff that takes time is the changes, is the fact that you're updating multiple PSDs. And that's all the stuff that, you know, and not only that for me, I don't care about it anymore. I want to move on to it. I want to move it into the web. Like, why, why am I changing this just so the client can get sign off saying, yes, all of those margins are now better? To me, that's that's where the waste comes in. Because, like I said, I mean, it, it takes time to design it in any program, whether you're using Macaw or, you know, you're going right into the web. It's, it takes time to design it. It's all of those small changes when the client's like, oh, I love it. This looks great. Okay, we got a couple of things we got to change, though. You know, and it's, those are the things that kill me. And they, they're, they're soul-sucking things that kill me sometimes. Hey, Ben. Yeah. Love looking at stuff new. Mm -hmm. What's that? SEO. Dude, this is a design talk. I said in the beginning, not developers, not SEO. You know, who needs SEO these days, right? Yeah, it's dying. I'm wondering, have you ever found yourself in this situation, or could you could you find it feasible? Do okay, but to take um, take some style tiles and take a wireframe and have a plan to use something like developer tools and Thunderbird and mm -hmm. drive through the responsive results on the fly right there. So they can, you know, or, or like Webflow, I'm really digging that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of like Macaw or Webflow, right? I mean, yeah. Who's used Webflow or Macaw here? Anybody? Nobody? Macaw? Nobody's downloaded the trial even? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, the problem with, uh, just a second, the problem with the, I, I downloaded the trial, but I have 15 days to play with it. And right. I played with it once, and I think my trial's probably up. Yeah, I'm not ready to pull the trigger on it. That's the thing. It's like, I don't want to commit to the trial, and I wouldn't have, but I feel like I had to touch it before this talk, to be honest. Um, <laughs> You know, another thing that I'm leaving out of, that I've kind of left out of the talk is Macaw and Webflow. Um, I really think that um, if I was to give this talk in a year from now, I would probably be talking more about Webflow or Macaw. Um, for me, I, I think it's a great, it, it will be a great prototyping tool. Um, I tried designing in it, and it's really fiddly. Um, to, to, once you start getting into the different views, it just didn't behave. You, the way I feel, and I've talked to other people too, that the way you have to, and I'm not as familiar with, with uh, Webflow, but I've used it once or twice. With Macaw, at least, you, if you build it perfectly, it works great. But as a messy like ideation design program, for me, it just doesn't work. I end up with just a garbled mess that doesn't work. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think um, there, are, there are programs and apps out now that are good, and I think they're going to continue to get better, and I really think they're the future. I really think they have a real um, potential in this space where you kind of, maybe, you know, maybe you go from um, the style tile, and you can, maybe you can go to the prototype. At the same time, it kind of depends on your process. I mean, if you're fast on the front end, well, does it make sense to build it in Macar Webflow if, if it's usable code, and you can take that code and move it to the final? Great. But if it's if you can't use it, then it's another step along the process, and um, it could just be just another thing. You know, I mean, we've already talked about a lot of steps already, so I'm not saying I'm I'm not I'm I'm saying yeah. I mean, if if it works for you, sure. Yeah. Well, I pulled you off on it. Well, the more I think the more my question is driven the interactive content you have, the, hard, the more painful those tools. Become. Yeah. Because it's just it's, it's really hard to take the code that comes out of those things. Uh, yeah. We, we've tried all kinds of things and we found there's really no alternative to hand coding that's interactive. Yeah, and, and I I'm. edit my question because I, I let you off. No, it's okay. that was a good question. I actually. Here's the thing if you, if you design for desktop view and then have the client use something like developer tools, have them open up in, in Thunderbird, mm -hmm. 
and, and drag the corner themselves and see it manifest in front of them. You're not going to Yeah, I mean, you could, you could do the corner, your, drag it yourselves, but I mean, it's not really a responsive site. You know, I mean, a re responsive, if you're looking at it, you know, responsive site should kind of reflow and, and op be optimized for the particular there's view. A, there's a responsive view, and you know, stone me if you need to, but there's a responsive view option. Yeah, but it doesn't, ref doesn't reflow all the content. It just, right? I mean, it it'll, if you give them a JPEG, it'll, it'll reflow the JPEG? Uh, you'll have to show me that. Does anybody ever else, anybody else do that? Yeah, you're talking about JPEG. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're not talking about a JPEG. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If, you're, if you value, if you want the client to value you for, for your design and your coding, you're not going to want to do that. Thing. You're going to want to say, yes, I'll handle that part. It's, in my experience, even teaching someone how to change their email client, it's way, way more than I would or, or that Google, Or that Google's not the URL bar, you know, when you do the search. So, I mean, you do it. All right, let me... Um, I'm really close to wrapping up, so um, just some kind of final ending things I can talk about, and then we can, I want to hear from you guys, because like I said, I'm, I'm not the expert here. Um, so where are we? And then anybody that needs to get going can get going, too. Um, so where are we in this process? Um, and I think we're kind of alluding to that, you know, kind of what's next, um, might be macaw. Um, but I also really feel that as, you know, I look back in my career, and when I first started designing, you know, luckily when I went to school, they had um, web design and print design, and I learned both. But as designers, I think our roles are evolving. I think we need to get more involved and at least have a better understanding of the development side of things. Um, we really need to know how our designs are going to work. I mean, interaction is so important for everything we do. And I think it's really important for the desktop, but it's even more important for mobile. Um, you know, sites are starting to feel more like apps now, and there's some really cool interactivity that's happening. Um, it, you know, we just need to take a larger role in the whole process and think of it as a holistic process. Um, as much as we can discuss the problems up front and during the whole process with the teams, talk to the developers up front, take their input. I love hearing from developers. Every time I start a project, I say, you know, tell me what you want from me. And a lot of times, I don't hear a whole lot. Developers talk to me. Tell me what you want. How do you like to receive things? How do you like? Don't tell me after I sent you something that that's not the way you wanted to receive it. Tell me now. How, you know, what makes your job easier? What types of things do you want to see? Um, I will build a PSD of um, H1, H2s, H3s, buttons, all of the elements that you want, if you want. But if, you know, if it's not useful to you, I'm not going to spend the extra, t extra time to do it. Um, you know, just have, just understand how our designs are getting implemented. Um, and, you know, what Melissa was saying, any time along the way that you can kind of tie, um, you know, the typical things uh, that clients may slow a project up on, um, tie it to money, you know? If they're the ones that are slowing the project down, you know, there's a certain capacity that we have, right? I mean, there's a certain bandwidth we have, and, you know, we, we line all the projects up. If they are holding the process up, well, they're hurting somebody else, they're hurting me, so anything we can use along the way to explain that to them, that really helps. Um, and then, you know, part of it, too, is um, you have to embrace the unknown a little bit. Sometimes, you know, some of these new processes, if they're new to you, just try a little bit of it. Like I said, uh, my next project, I'm definitely doing style tiles. Um, I've done it a little bit, and I'm going to start using them a little bit more. But you never know what's going to come out of the unknown until you try it a little bit. But iterate in small steps. Um, I'm not going to use this whole process. Um, I hope, you know in a, maybe a couple months or a year from now, I look back and I have a similar process, but it's probably not going to be this one, but I'm definitely going to keep iterating it. And developers, um, embrace this way of thinking, you know. Uh, if you are frustrated with getting the designs when the project's signed off by the client, the designer says, here you go, I'm done with it, dude. You know, talk to us up front. What, what can we do better next time? Um, and, you know, feel free to, at least when you're working with me, come in earlier in the process and let's talk. Because I want to build a cool site. I don't want to just hand it off and be done. 
Yeah. So, so in your experience, are you working with the same developer usually, or are you, like, it's a, it's, it changes. So, so who, who decides who the designer and who the developer is? Me. Is, is the client usually. Or? Usually so, me. So, so you're looking for a developer. Uh, often, I mean, not always. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, it, well, I, no, I say it depends. Um, I've handed designs off to Cole at um, at Maker Shed or you know Make Magazine, um, and they just wanted PS fought PSDs. We do that sometimes. Um, I did a design with uh, Melissa because she's uh, really good with Vin sixty five, which is a um, e commerce uh, web platform. Um, I'm talking with Aaron about a WordPress site. Um, so for me, it just it. Every project for, for me kind of changes depending on what the client's needs are, really. I don't know that I, I, I mean, I build out as much as I possibly can because I like to. Uh, but sometimes we just get too busy and I just need someone to, you know, maybe it's just front end, maybe it's front end and back end. So the client comes to your agency and then you figure out what, whatever else needs to be, like, whether you need to find the right resources. Yeah, typically. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why WIMP's been awesome because usually within a couple of minutes I have somebody. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we start talking to the developer before we do any quoting. Yeah. No. Uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, I want I want to make sure that they're comfortable with the budget. Um, you know, we usually we try to get um, you know at least enough of a ballpark to make sure they're taken care of. Um, but you know, I want to have that communication up front. I want to know they're comfortable with what we're doing. I try to get as much much uh, information as I can um, at the front of the process about what the client needs to be able to quote on it and to be able to talk to a developer. And sometimes that's hard. Um, sometimes there's obviously some some vagaries. Usually, what happens is we'll go out and we'll quote the project. So when we get a yes, uh, as we get more details, I will talk with the developer, make sure they're comfortable with everything that's happening. And I would say, you know. More often than I'd like to admit, giving this talk, there's probably a big gap in the communication with the developer. And one of the things that actually Aaron and I have talked about that you know we're we're there's this, it's going to be a long process of just getting the client on board for this. They're just they're um, they're really going to be slow on their end in just getting to the point to where we can do the work. But we've talked a little bit about you know what can her and I do. I mean, we don't work in the same office, you know, and she has a, a busy schedule of. Um, of clients, and I don't know the answer to that is yet, and that's a particular area that probably is pretty common for us. Of you know, I want to be more involved with some with Aaron or somebody like Aaron. Um, how do we make that happen? Um, and um, I'm almost done with this talk, and I really, if anybody can, or if you can even answer it right now, I really want to know the answer to that. And I really want to. I'm an idea guy. I think that you know this talented group of Wimps could form a system, perhaps maybe a custom CRM that's Wimpified, and then. Internally, projects are led into a process that everyone openly commits to what that process looks like. And then we can run that through the Wimp engine and then open it up internally and kind of have our own little intra company freelance model that we can throw projects in. Sounds interesting. Okay, <laughs> cool. So it's awesome that you say that, Brian. <laughs> One thing that we do have, we're trying, we're in sort of the, the beginning stages of trying to work towards is actually having a, a, a physical location and building where, where we will not only have our meetups, but actually have some sort of a weird morphed version of a co-working space collaborative area. And um, I think a lot will, will stem off of that once that happens. Yeah, I think that's hard too. I mean, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, every like I've been saying, every project we do is is very different and it t depends on the particular needs of the client but let me just finish up and then we can really get into this um, so you know integ integrate with the developers and the designers and I just want to leave with um, one more quote um, by Andrew Clark um, so um, what is a modern designers canvas it's not Photoshop or sketch sketch is a, a program like Photoshop not sketches I'm not talking about sketching um, it's not pattern libraries or style guides. It's not breakpoints or media queries. It's none of these things. It's up here. It's our minds and our ideas, but it's also out there and the people we inspire. And that really is the best, most important, and long-lasting work we can do. So the kind of whole point of this is what gets us to the end of our designs fastest? What communicates to the client as fast as possible? And um, 
how can we work with the people in a more iterative, uh, kind of holistic approach. So that's it. And uh, I wanted to include some, uh, I said, you know, thanks to these folks, they said it better than I can. Andrew Clark, the Tomorrow Lab. Um, and I'll post these, uh, this slide, or you, you can access these slides um, at this URL if you guys have any interest in, you know, getting these links or anything. Yeah, to, gonna be posted that link. Um, yeah we'll, we'll, we can we'll post it. it. Um, and, and, I, and I'll probably post some notes at some point. Some of the people that couldn't make it wanted to, to kind of hear what we talked about. And like I said, my goal for this really is to foster a bigger communication between all of us. You know, it's kind of a catalyst for talking about all of these things. Um, Talking about the issue with you know getting developers on board and discussing projects earlier and you know maybe a little more often I'd love to hear anything developers want to say about this whole process. So open it up to the floor. Any yeah. thoughts, Joshua, Linda? One thing you didn't mention was I mean like myself I'm a designer but I kind of futz around in CSS a lot for my refining. Even if I have to put it in something like Dreamweaver or something that I can do really quickly, even though the final product might not be there, but then I've already got the CSS. And you didn't really talk about that if you use anything like that, or does anybody else? You mean what you do for writing your HTML and CSS? Or? No, I mean, like in you the, in the re you, you, to, design, to refine yeah. my design, you know, I mean, I'll rough it out in Photoshop, but mm -hmm. then I want to put it in something so I can tinker in CSS rather than in Photoshop, like sure. margins or whatever colors, fonts. And I just wondered, I you didn't so. mention that, and that's so what you, I do. That's kind of a yeah. build process. Yeah. Zerbs Foundation uh -huh. is one place to start. Bootstrap. Yeah. There's also this tool called Typecast. Yeah, I, thank you. Yeah. And it basically allows you to do the same thing, but with type. Access most of the fault library, the Adobe stuff, and the Titan stuff. And so you can really build the design in there. I found it's more helpful for more text based designs, a lot of information sites. It's not as helpful if you've got a lot of other things going on, you know, shots and little sections. So it's that way it's something, but if you want to play with it, those are some handy tools. Well, I guess I'm talking about things like, you know, image borders. You know, just stuff that well, that I mean, for me, that's just something I just do with whatever you're, whatever I'm comfortable. Like I use Sublime Text um, for just doing my HTML and the CSS. Um, Linda, perhaps another solution is actually find a person who's good at that and develop a power partnership with them, saying that you know, obviously you have skill sets that you are great at, and they wish that they could do some of the things that you do. You guys just trade time, so you don't have to leave that done. You can depend on the humans to do well, so that. But I think what Linda's saying too is you, you want to be able to design it and see it yourself. And it's I mean, hard. I use it as a design tool, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I don't want anyone to take it. I mean, I, you know, they can add on to it or whatever, but, you know. Just the, I mean, that's something you could, I mean, if you want, if you use Macaw or Webflow, that's kind of, I mean, I, I would see Macaw or Webflow would be one step before you would take something to live HTML and working in it. I mean, they have all of the, the kind of buttons and tools that you would have in CSS. So you could look into that. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like MS Expression more, and I like Freeweaver, just for the quick. Yeah, I mean, why would you want to go out of CSS if that's what's going to be doing? Well, then I don't think I understand your question. I mean, why not do it in CSS? I mean, if you're yeah, comfortable with it, like sure. I do do it in CSS. Yeah, but great. You did not mention that it was a tool of yours, and I just wondered how... Well, I think, think for me, that the, this talk was about getting it to that point. Getting it to the point to where it, now you're working in the browser. So that would be the next step. I guess I'm saying, I guess I work in the browser. Good. Yeah, I do, I, good. I think as soon as you can get... That's the whole... I guess the point of this, and thank you if, if that wasn't clear, is getting it to the browser really as fast as you can. I think the, the term here is you're designing in the browser, basically. Is, yeah. Is your well, I mean, I designed a Photoshop and then take it to the browser really well, early and yeah. tinker around right, with the, it. The, and the tweaks and all the refinements. Yeah, and then the, the CSS is mm -hmm. already yeah. there. Sure, and yeah. I want to have an intermediate step. I think what we're brushing up against here is that everybody has um, so there's like a like an idealized process and there's a way to uh, start kind of low fidelity so you're not 
creating the impression with your client that here is your complete PSE, it's going to be pixel perfect. Um, so, you know, for myself as a developer, I, when I had to do design, um, I would do a similar thing because I, you know, I would do a little bit of Photoshop, but then I would really just build things in the browser because that's what I'm fastest in. I'm yeah. fast with code. Actually, yeah, I have a good point to that too. So if you're fastest with Photoshop or, you know, Ben, you, you, you <clears throat> made your, uh, your wireframe in Photoshop. Some people do it in PowerPoint. Yeah, so really or Keynote, or right. So whatever yeah. tool you're you're most fast with, and and that, you know actually, Linda. I've been given mockups in AutoCAD before. Wow, that's I've never heard of that. I know, but no, actually, I'd like I'd like to address that. I mean, I'm not a developer. I use CSS as a design tool. That's what I'm saying. No, and let's talk about that a little bit because one of the ways, one of the things that I really like to do is I'll go back and forth. Uh, whatever, if I'm faster in Photoshop, I'll do something in Photoshop. And then a lot of times when I start getting the designs into um, the browser, if there's something that I want to try out that I'm faster in Photoshop with, what I'll do is I'll just take a screenshot, I'll take it into Photoshop, I'll tweak it in Photoshop, to, do I like it? Uh, no, okay, move on. Or yes, yeah. then I build it yeah. in CSS. Okay. And that's a great way of working too. But you know, I guess it's coming from, I started in print, so in InDesign, in those kind of programs, we use styles all the time. So. In, InDesign is actually maybe one of the better web design tools. But how can you hand off InDesign files to a developer? Uh, for that exact so. reason, actually, there's, there's some, I think, extensions to Photoshop that makes it really work. Yeah. Like, like, or CSS hat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah. allows you to build it out in Photoshop, and then you can like, export CSS from that. that. That's actually in the core of the latest version of Photoshop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have paragraph styles and everything. Yeah. I haven't personally used it. I've seen a video of it. I've used it. InDesigns are better. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, you, you can link to external files, too. And again, Linda, to come back to your question too, there's a lot of stuff I threw out for this talk. I mean, it was to be honest, it was really overwhelming trying to sort through all of the different ways you can build a site. What I what I was trying to do is just kind of I came up with a process of this is how this could work, and everybody here, nobody here is going to follow that process exactly. I'm not going to follow it exactly. So, I mean, there's so many different tools out there, so many different ways of working. And this is kind of a sampling of some of the stuff that people are doing right now. And some of the reasoning, trying to, I was trying to show some of the reasoning behind it. Of It's a little faster and iterative. So we have time for one more question before we wrap up here. Anybody? There was, there was a request for a little more information on that page description. Mm. I was going to say, one of my first steps, we talked about text. One of my first steps is to do what I call it text design. Where I basically do a layout for each page, and I list in order of priority mm -hmm. the different elements on that page, just the text. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way of really putting it in front of the client. Here's your page. I have nothing on it, or there is. And then I have a set of about six questions that are there to answer for any given page. What's the purpose of the page? Who are we talking to? Who's the main, like, what's the main call to action that we want to happen? And if they can't answer these basic questions, you have to wonder whether the page mm -hmm. needs to be there or not. But right at the beginning, you get the structure, you're able to get the priority of it, and the goals of that particular page, all in one place. And it really allows you to look at the strategy of the site. Are we effectively serving this end goal of selling widgets or whatever mm -hmm. it is? Yeah, I like it. And I, to be honest, I'd love it if you would mind sharing some of that early process stuff. That's something that if anybody wants to share some of that, um, I just would like to see because I know I'd learn from that. Um, and, and there's always something that somebody can do better and faster. And um, I don't know. I like seeing the process. I know myself as, a, as a, someone who's development focused but worked on small enough projects where I ended up doing a little bit of everything. Um, I, I do not do well working somebody through a design. Like, I don't know what questions to ask necessarily. I mean, I've learned over time, but it's very helpful for me as a developer who often has to wear a lot of hats to start with the text, to start with the priorities. You know, what are your business goals? What are the calls to action? And then 
what elements on the page serve that goal. And then once you've enumerated that, you when you get into the design process, you no longer have to worry about the client saying, well, make that bigger. You know, make that pop. Because, hey, you can't make everything pop because then suddenly mm -hmm. everything's just drowning. And you really need those, uh, those call to actions and that priority to, to have any framework to really go forward with. So even as a developer, that text is great. To, to directly follow up on that, we were talking about uh, wireframes earlier. I don't show my wireframes to clients mostly because they're not interested in them. The client's not interested in the project because they're done. It, it ends up confusing them. Right, yeah. right. Uh, not only that, the poetry lies in the less, the more control you have over the project, the less involvement the client has, the better the product becomes. The wireframes. Amen. Sure. Well, Amen, dude. The wireframes <laughs> are for the developer. <laughs> so I can create one PSD file, then give the developer wireframes, and he can take it from there. Yeah, nice. So we're going to wrap it up. Let's uh, run a pause for Ben. Yeah. Thanks.